virtual photo walks. Yes, good afternoon everyone. My name is Barry DeBolin. I'm the MP for Halliburton and Corth Lakes Brock and uh, one of the deputy speakers here in Canada's Parliament. Welcome to your virtual tour of our Parliament buildings. I don't know if any of you have ever been here before, but it's a beautiful Gothic structure. Uh, when kids come here, they think they're at Hogwarts and that uh, Harry Potter's going to come around the corner at any moment. Um, but it's, um, I've been here for 10 years as a member of Parliament. You know, John put the question out there in terms of why I decided to run. I don't know, that's a, maybe that's another whole story. But pe many people have asked me why did I want to get into politics, uh, including my mother. And uh, my answer has always been I don't really know I don't know why some people like country music and others like opera in the same way, so I'm not sure why I was drawn to public life. But it is, uh, it is an honor to do this job. Um, I get an amazing variety, everything from very down-home, kind of rural conversations, standing in, the, you know, in a farm lane somewhere or standing you know, in a store in a small town talking about what's going on in the community and the local economy, right through to traveling internationally, you know, representing Canada, going to meetings, whether it's at the United Nations in New York, or uh, I'm the liaison for Canada with Korea and have been very involved with our negotiating a free trade agreement um, for the last few years. So uh, my day or my week can range right from, as I say, uh, standing in a farmyard to standing in a fifth grade classroom back in Lindsay, right up to uh, attending the G8 and uh, having an opportunity to meet presidents of other countries. So it's a fascinating job. And uh, here in Ottawa, in our parliament, um, every member has at least one additional responsibility. I mean, some serve as party leaders, some serve as cabinet ministers, or in opposition parties, they're lead critics on certain files. Uh, some people chair committees. Uh, but there's a small group of four MPs, four of the 308 members, who uh, basically serve as the chair occupants uh, and, and the speakers for the chamber. Um, the analogy, again, I use with people is we're like the referees of the match. And if you've seen, uh, you know, a dozen or 15 kids who want to have a pickup game of hockey, so, you know, they throw all their sticks in a pile and they pull their sticks out and decide who's on which team. And usually they force one of the kids to be the referee, uh, which isn't seen as as much fun, but it's important to make the game work. And it kind of works the same here in Parliament, that we choose one of the MPs to serve as a speaker. Um, our system is very different from the United States. In the U.S., the Speaker of the House is the leader of one team. Uh, the analogy to Canada would actually be our Prime Minister, who's the leader of the largest party, uh, would actually be the equivalent of the Speaker. Uh, our speaker, on the other hand, agrees to be neutral and agrees to step back from partisan politics, to not uh, engage in, in the debate, but really to enforce the rules. And so uh, the speaker, that's uh, his responsibility, and the speaker then selects three deputies to assist him in that role, to fill the chair whenever it sits, to chair many other meetings, and to represent him in, in different places. So I've had the honor to serve as a deputy to uh, not only this speaker, Speaker Scheer, but also to his predecessor, Peter Milliken, who was, the, who was the speaker previously for 10 years. So that's kind of the special role I have. And as John pointed out, that means I'm not out there kind of either making or throwing snowballs at the other side. Uh, but in fact, I'm one of the referees and I try to stay out of the, the hurly-burly of day-to-day -day politics. Well, we're going to uh, head down to the uh, parliamentary library. So we may uh, log out here. Uh, we'll be back in about three minutes. Okay, guys? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Well, welcome to the Parliamentary Library. Um, I think you've, uh, John just panned the room. You see how beautiful it is, all the wood and all the wood carving. Um, in terms of uh, history, um, Canada was formed in 1867 and short, shortly thereafter they started building uh, the Parliament buildings here in Ottawa. Um, in the early 1900s, in 1916, there was actually a fire that most of the original building burnt down 
um, except this room. So the, this library, which is at the north end of the building, survived the fire. Um, so for people who come here for a tour, what they'll notice when they come in the front of the building, it's a neo-Gothic architecture. It was built in the 1920s, uh, very clean, uh, mostly stone. But when they come to the north end of the building and enter this room, the library, suddenly they're confronted with a very different uh, design vernacular here. It's much warmer. There's a lot of wood, um, and it is. It has a. It has a much warmer uh, feel than the rest of the building. And in many ways, it's always a favorite uh, for guests when they come here. Now, I don't know if you can see behind me, but there's a very large statue uh, in the middle of this round room, and um, that is of Queen Victoria. And um, I presume. Canadians listening in probably uh, will have a sense of why she's highlighted here in our library. But for any non-Canadians, uh, American friends we have online, I'll give you a quick history lesson. Um, in the United States in the 1820s, there was the notion of manifest destiny. And most Americans believed uh, that it was only a matter of time until the United States incorporated all of North America, including Canada. At that time, Americans looked at their northern neighbors as, you know, hostages of a British colony that needed to be liberated one day. Um, what many Americans didn't realize is that uh, many Canadians uh, liked that circumstance and actually wanted to be part of a separate country. So at the end of the American Civil War in 1865, in Canada we feared that an American invasion at that time that would take us over, from our perspective, to take us over. I guess from an American perspective, it was to liberate us from our British colonial masters. And uh, at that time, there were four kind of fractious colonies here uh, in the eastern part of Canada, what are now known as Ontario, Quebec, uh, Prince, I Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia, and, and New Brunswick, actually five provinces. And uh, at that time, this external threat of an American invasion actually caused Canadians to come together and say, to set aside their differences and to actually approach the Queen in London asking if we can be a separate country. So um, I often say if you want to understand some of the differences between Americans and Canadians, if you look to the birth of our nations, one born in a revolution, uh, the other born in a negotiation, uh, it, I think it, it gives insight into the difference between our people. So anyway, a bunch of Canadians got on a boat, went over to London, met with Queen Victoria and said, can we please have our own country? Uh, and her response was, yes, you can. And we probably said, thank you very much. And then there was a discussion about where the capital city would be. And as you can imagine, all of the provinces wanted the capital city. All of the major cities in Canada at that time wanted to be the capital. But Queen uh, Victoria was wise enough to know that rather than make one group happy and everybody else unhappy, she would actually pick it herself and she chose Ottawa which ironically made everybody equally unhappy because, you know, it would be like, uh, you know, today in the United States suggesting you're going to put your capital somewhere out in South Dakota or somewhere like that. Uh, but Queen Victoria had two or three reasons. First of all, she knew if she put it in one of the major cities, she would offend people from the other cities. Secondly, she knew that uh, she wanted it away from uh, the American border because it would be more susceptible to invasion. Uh, so Ottawa is kind of up in the bush and a couple of hundred or a hundred miles away from the American border. And thirdly, it sits right on the Ottawa River, kind of straddling Ontario and Quebec, which are the two largest provinces. So anyway, that's how the capital came to be here in Ottawa. Uh, that's how uh, Queen Victoria not only played a key role in uh, establishing or creating an independent country called Canada, but actually chose this place and this city as the capital. So for all those reasons, she is well respected and loved here in Canada and she has a great big statue here in the middle of our library. Well, I don't know, do I take questions or I, I can hear a few voices in the background. Sure, shoot away guys. Yes, it's, um, it, it's kind of church-like in here actually when people come in as they say it's very quiet. Now again, um, technology has changed. I was a student in Ottawa back in the early 1980s uh, in the pre-computer era. I think we still use punch cards. 
uh, for for the computers. But um, you know, at that time, this place was very busy, and people, members of Parliament, were coming in doing research. Uh, the the newspapers are brought here every day. Even today, you know, there are newspapers from across the country, from Halifax in the east to Vancouver on the west. Today, it's not a big deal because you can go online and read those papers. But even 25 years ago, uh, if you were a member of Parliament from Vancouver and you wanted to read your local newspaper, it was very difficult to get it here. But the the the, the Parliament of Canada, together with Air Air Canada, had an elaborate system in place how to get the newspapers here as quickly as possible in the morning. So 25 years ago this room was full of people and a lot of people would be using the resources. Um, what we have seen over the years is that most of those resources, uh, much of that information is now available online. And so this room is actually much less busy than it used to be the old uh, card catalogs. I mean you can actually see in some of the alcoves here the drawers that uh, if, if people remember back, you know, even when I was in high school, you had the little, you would search for a book on the Dewey Decimal System either by author or by title or by subject, and you had these long drawers with little paper cards in them. Well, the drawers are still here, but uh, when this library was completely rehabilitated about 10 years ago, uh, they were reinstalled, but the cards are no longer there. Everything is online now. So. Are these uh, alcoves significant, named after particular people? Or? Oh, now it's now I'm going to start getting questions that I can't answer um, in terms of the historic significance, the number of alcoves. Um, there are, if you look on each of the alcoves, there are the shields of the provinces uh, that were part of Canada at the time uh, that this was built. Um, Canada, like the United States, kind of started off with a certain number of provinces and then subsequently Others joined, so right above us, with the uh, the buffalo. That's the man, the Manitoba crest. Um, there are. Uh, I'm not sure which one that is. I think it might be. I I don't know. Is the short answer? Severed Island behind it. Yeah, I kind of almost ripped the microphone. Out. And then uh, the next one. I'm pretty good at the one that actually says DC. You know, uh, but uh, it is a beautiful place. And I'm making much more noise than they normally allow in here. But um, as I said, when I was an undergraduate, I remember I had to write a paper and I couldn't find the book. At my university, all the copies were out, I couldn't buy it. And somebody at that time said, You should phone your MP and go to the parliamentary library, which I never would have thought of. So. Bill Scott was our member of Parliament at that time, had been here for many years, and I contacted his office. This would have been in 1982. And uh, in fact, I, I came here. This is, uh, this is a closed stack uh, library, the old fashioned kind, where you kind of fill out on a piece of paper what book you want to give it to a librarian, and they go and get the book for you. For people from Ontario, I say it's the old Ontario liquor store model where you write down what you want and someone goes into a back room and brings it in for you. No merchandising allowed. But uh, but anyway, so I came here and I was given the book and I, I believe it or not, I was actually sitting in the very alcove that we're in today for many days uh, working on my term paper with pencil and paper and uh, using this book. So even at the time it was pretty neat just to be in this room, just to be here um, and uh, to realize the history that, that had taken place you know, in this building. This is quite the proof of concept of what we talked about originally when I showed you my crazy idea that we could we could transmit like this to the indigenous people up north, and not just hospitals, but all the folks that can't make the long trek here. And yeah. Now with security, things are a little more difficult. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, this is very impressive the way that this can work. I'm struck by two or three things. First of all, I'm struck by how simple this is. Essentially, with an iPhone and uh, you know a basic. Headset here. And a good, a good teleconferencing interface in your, your set. Yeah, we can connect all over and where that can reach. And it can reach across the street or halfway around the world to anyone that has a connection to it. For the disabled, it's just somebody having the will to do it. Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a neat thing that you're doing. Um, it also, uh, so there's the mobility of the audience, and if they're mobility limited, is, but there's also the issue of security, that we can get inside a building like this where there's security. Um, people just can't necessarily walk in off the street. 
Um, so that's another issue, I'm sure, but there's lots of interesting places that you can get permission to go into. We had an incident here, many of you will know, back in October, where a gunman entered this building right outside these doors. Uh, and there was a firefight right in that to Hall of Honor, right where we just walked. So security on Parliament Hill is a lot tighter than it was even six months ago. And, um, uh, you know, we're kind of revisiting all of our security protocols. That's un an unfortunate reality in the world today. But this technology helps us, you know, to get around. Yeah, well, I think, as I say, that program, we're doing something cool. The sky is the limit and give them an opportunity to have a virtual tour of this place where kind of all of the flying here really isn't a practical. You're a geologist guy, maybe a virtual prospect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think I, this, te this technology fits in your pocket and you can take it anywhere you want to go. So I, I think it's really neat what you're doing. And, uh, you know, the opportunities that it offers are truly limited. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, uh, and we'll stay and wander around. And, uh, yeah, we should go back up to your office. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess that's uh, that's enough for now. I'll just uh, get this and we'll sign. We'll just, we'll just sign out. And, uh, and, uh, what do you think, guys? Yeah, it, it's 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 over. Virtual phone.